together it was very successful. Uh, today we have Judd Smith as uh, for, for our last last one with some sail trip trips and uh, this is dear to my heart as I have the fortunate luck to be sailing with Judd for the past bunch of years on the Africa boat and uh, the learning never stops when he says, just ease it a quarter inch, <laughs> then it's quiet, and then I hear, yeah, that's better. 
<laughs> so with no further ado. <laughs> Thanks everybody for coming. It still feels like winter to me, so yeah. we might as well spend a night, a quick evening. I won't tie up for everybody too long with going over some. At least we get to look at some good photos of sales, and uh, I saved the better stuff for last. So the, the sales that um, that uh, uh, you know that I sell with my boat, we'll save those for for the last, which are probably more like everybody else sales. But we'll start with some, you know, some theme that you know I'm trying to decide when what. When I was going to do this thing, Marcel asked me, what do you want to do? I'm like, I have no idea. But, yeah. but anyhow, we started going through a presentation. We came up with a, a theme of what to, to work on. So uh, what the theme was, we decided to uh, just talk about Beetle Cat sale development for the next hour. How's that <laughs> Finally. Yeah, exactly. Finally. You know, it just doesn't get covered enough. But, uh, next now uh, here's oh go back to that uh, the the townie that's uh, Chris Howes actually sailing with my partner Bob Wilcox I, I believe that's Bob Croy from in the townie and that was kind of interesting about the townie I mean, Chris does a nice job selling the townie did a good job like and the the reason he cut, has gotten it an edge he does a good job of moving his weight forward is he, he brings his traveler windward up to the center you know right over the tiller and he brought the jib lead in closer and he, you know he. So he just sails less distance than the other boats around him. So the nice thing about Chris is he's done a nice job of trying to bring the rest of the fleet to doing what he's doing and showing what he's doing. And it's helped, and now he doesn't win all the time. So. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, as a result, he, he's done well. Maybe we'll get him to come back a little bit more and sail the boat. But um, you know, the town class maybe is the biggest fleet in Martinhead right now. Could be. Yeah. Done pretty well. I don't know if there are any town class sailors in here. All right, there we go. We got plenty of them. So, so uh, we'll, we we will touch on any town class questions we need to the next slide. Great. The uh, the classes that I race in pretty much is the Etchells J70. So you'll see a lot of Etchells at J70. But I do think all this stuff carries over from various boats, and they sail on all sorts of boats. This happens to be a boat I coached last year that won the worlds. Um, uh, a, Guy from Long Island called John Somi and his team. He's still with Victor Diaz. Um, you know, they had, um, so I coached him for all the winter, you know, probably starting in like December last year and the Worlds were in like April last year. So right around this time last year, they wrapped up. So that was the boat they sailed for us. And I spent a lot of time. So I have a lot of pictures of those, but I thought the Etchells was a good boat to compare because the displacement and everything is not too different from the big boats we race and whatnot. And it does have a lot of adjustments, a mass band, a lot of sail controls. And you know, we only sail with one jib like everybody else and one main like everybody else. I guess we have two jibs, but we have to make them work through the full range. Um, this is a team, I, I put this on to show you what I don't like. Now I went down and coached in, um, I want to say this is a little after COVID maybe. I went down and coached uh, some, around this, around May, some boats, some Etchells down in um, Ride, New York. And, yeah, I'm already got the boats. And um, it's always hard. I'll go to the next slide. When you go, first time you go out in the coach boat, and this is what you're looking at. It's a lot different than what I'm used to looking at coaching the world champions. So um, I took these pictures just as comparison because the reality is, when, you know, the beginning of the season, first time out, you can see it's kind of was probably pretty cold and lie on sound. And you know, this is what I'm used to looking at when I first coach it. Everybody goes out and they just kind of casually trim in a little bit and kind of reaching around. And it takes a while to, and then I take a lot of photos to try to bring up the speed. And I, I go talk to everybody and try to make changes. And then I go to the next boat and I come back five minutes later and they put everything back to the way they used to do it. <laughs> um, I remember doing that with a, mar a clinic, you go to the next slide, in Marblehead. Um, and I don't know if. Uh, I haven't seen him tonight. Uh, Don Miller was out doing sailing the Etchells. And Don, I kept doing this circle around. I'd come back. I'd go get him set up. I'd say, that's really good, Don. Mark everything. Everything's good. I'd go around, look at the other boats, and come back to Don 10 minutes later, and everything's back to where it was. I'm like, I did that three times. I'm like, OK, I'm done. Um, so you see these guys. There's some, so these are pictures. And they got better. I got them to trim in the sails at that team. They only were up two up. But got them to trim sails in tighter. This is. Um, 
pictures of the world champion, that's Veracity on, on the uh, left-hand side, and Peter Duncan's team, who won, I think, like four of the, four of the, um, of the five regattas this, this uh, winter in Miami. And you can see they're cheated pretty hard, travelers, booms above center. Um, you know, just along those lines, of like, like Chris House was doing in the townie, you know, getting in light air and the conditions we primarily race in, getting the sail plan as powered up as you can. You go look at TP-52s in Newport, and that's a, those guys have the boom this far above center. Everybody says, well, that's not the look. Well, look where the lower baton is. So one of the things I always look at, we have a backstand at the Etchells, is we try to see where the lower baton is, uh, where it falls, um, when you're right behind the boat, I mean, in relation to the back shape, right to the center line. So we kind of try to get the lower baton closer to the center line as much as we can to have a little more grip. You can't sail around in real light air when the sail's too full or the, the wind won't get around them. So it's one of these things you sail with pretty powerful jibs. You go to the next slide. And, um, and pretty flat mains. And once again, how do you compare that to my team that I'm coaching in Rye? You know, just to put it in perspective, you got you know, world champions, and then you got you know a team that okay, I've got to. This is a club racing team. How am I going to make this better? So, go go to the next one. Um, this is veracity in real light air. You see the crew position. You see how high the boom. Look where the boom is. But also look where the lower stripe is. Pretty close to center line, not quite on center line. So I basically line up the backstay when I'm taking a photo to see where we are. But they've got the top batten, each telltale flowing in the top batten. There's nothing particularly special about that other than you can see that they're not sail, sailing around with the main too full. You know, in light air, you can't be too full. It's max power you can be, which is max power is around 10 knots. You can be as full as you can. Back to our Ryan, New York, back to American Yacht Club. And this is one of the better sailors, Donny Dowd, in uh, City Wild. And I uh, got those guys, they, spent, they were out there first, got them to trim in harder. And um, you know, one of the things that helmsmen can't do on a boat, maybe helmsmen oftentimes are among the better sailors on the boat. They certainly write the check, so. But um, oftentimes the helmsman just can't see, even with a spreader window, can't see where the jib trim. So other than you go down, and you put reference marks on, you go down and look at it before the start, this, this, I always find that the thing that's always screwed up, whether it's a J70 and Etchells, any boat I'm on, is that you worry about, if you don't have Marcel on the boat trimming, or Andy, then you better be counting on your true crew doing a good job trimming, and the jibs trimmed in all the way. So one of the questions that, like I always ask, they always, they're, I'm always talking about, where are we on the trim? You know, how, how does it look? Are we a total trim? We have marks on the spreaders. And we're always talking about where we are relative to how we're going, especially as you're going from the lightest speed, you know, or coming out of a, you know, accelerating to, you know, the full chat speed. Okay, we're at full speed, now we're at total trim. We definitely had total trim. I'm always asking about the jib, because I can look up, I can see the main, but I can't see the jib. So I'm always asking about the jib and whether we're at total, tri total trim, because I, if we, the jib's not trimmed right, usually there's big problems. The main's a little wrong, it doesn't really matter. That's critical. You can go to the next slide. That's doggy down. Oh, this is a star. I just want to put it for a comparison. I'm not even sure who it is. Um, but, um, but, you know, the, the stars, the reason I like the star as a comparison, it's a super overpowered boat. So it's one boat, they don't have a spinnaker. So they go upwind, you'd have to take this, um, a boat that's kind of overpowered, this gargantuan main, but they go downwind with just the main and jib, like a snipe. And um, so as a result, you need to have a really full main for downwind, but you've got to be able to flatten it up upwind. So that's why the stars is the best pointing boat that I sail because it's the most overpowered um, boat. And because it's so that overpowered, which is really the theme, you can sit the boat goes higher and higher. The more you're underpowered, especially in condition in light air like we sail around in, the more you can't point. And and the tacking angles get wider and wider. The star tacks at 60 degrees at you know in max power conditions and above. I mean it, you, there's no point in putting the bow down but you don't go a lot faster. So you've got a huge amount of range of mass bend to take what a sail that's otherwise really flat, I mean really deep. So it's got about 12 inches of love curve in it. So you have to bend the mass. So when you're doing a sail development, sail design, or like that, so we, you know, the first of all your, the way to flatten a sail, of course, the town is you can't really do it. You can't bend the mass. But on a boat like this, that's how they get rid of all the shaping in the sail that helps them downwind. 
but they got to get rid of it upwind. So they bend the mass, they sheet the main, and they bend the mass, which is basically main sheet tension. And, um, and the mass bends, you know, about a foot or nearly a foot um, at the top speed. And then, um, and then what that is, basically the first two thirds of, we designed in about two thirds of that, a love curve of the sail, and the final third of mass bend is used to flatten the main. That's pretty much the case with all sails, all mainsails. So you use the last 30% of total mass bend, to, that's the amount, that's when you're flattening the mainsail. Okay, you go to the next slide. But the star is kind of unique in that way. There's an Etchell's main, that happened to be the bike, the boat I was sailing at the Worlds last year. And um, actually looks, you know, flat to me here, but it's not, it would measure the stripes. We'll look at measuring stripes here shortly. But that's kind of very typical looking Etchell's main. Go to the next one. Probably a bit of breeze there. Spent a lot of time looking at head stay sag. Head stay sag in a displacement boat's a big thing. It's in a, in a town meeting. You don't want to be bound up in the head stay. It's how you get range of, 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 uh, of power. You know, in as much as we bend the mast to, or to flatten the main or reef the main or whatever you do to depower it, on a, the biggest variable on a head sole is head stay sag. It's the hardest thing to control. Um, in a way, you can make it your friend or, or your enemy. But we have a lot of control in the etchels, some control anyhow of head stay sag, um, you know, with back stay pressure, just like you would on, the, on a big boat. But um, but we also how much we keep the mass under structure. So if the mass bends a lot, the head stay will bend a lot. If the mass is held stiffer, like any truss system, the head stay will be stiffer. So that's true on pretty much any any boat. So the etchels we have to restrict the mass bend, and except for in light air when we want head stay sag. So we use head stay sag as our friend. Put the side, the next one on. And we check it fore and aft and side to side. Now, head stay sag, it doesn't sag as much um, uh, fore and aft on any boat as it sags about twice as much side to side. It's just the way the forces are on the boat. Um, so anyhow, we're always monitoring you know, sag what we get, but we also have to design sails that can sail with the sag we have. J70 has a hard time controlling head stay sag too. Most boats do. Most boats with furling systems have a hard time controlling head stay sags. Um, but you gotta be able to have, um, be able to manage it, I, I think is the word for it. So here's what happens, is you're sailing around, you can go to the next slide, you're sailing around a lot of breeze, and that's the sagging the most it possibly does in a breeze, and the jib's getting the fullest it ever does in a breeze. Whereas in light air, when you need the most power, the head stays the most, often the most bound up. So kind of thing, that's why probably in the townie, for instance, you sail around with the rig kind of loose, so, you can get some head stay sag in light air. It's a big thing, even in um, a, even in um, sailing any of the boats we do. We spend a lot of time trying to manage head stay sag in all the boats they sail. A lot of more sag in light air, less sag in breeze. It's just at the worst possible time when it's getting windier and windier. You're trying to get rid of a head stay sag, and it's not easy to get rid of. The reason I put up these slides, um, you know, whenever I. You know, this all, we all sail around, you know, there's probably a bunch of PHRF people here, not all one design people here. But the biggest variable with the boats that we often sail out here, you know, PHRF and whatnot, is the displacement and sailor displacement. Now, I picked that one of the, you know, heaviest boats that I know of that kind of is actively racing. And you can see the sailor displacement is down under 16%. So for, for the weight, it's a, it doesn't have a lot of sail here. The problem with this, even with a Genoa, is you can't, in light air, it's very hard to get the boat going. And um, there's not much you can do about it. because So that is the thing, is the boat that's so underpowered and so heavy, because the sail air displacement is so low, which is, that boat was designed in the early 70s. And it's a good, nice sailing boat, but it's, Hard to get it going in marbling conditions. Go to the next one. <laughs> this is a boat I sailed on. Um, Robbie kind of I handed Robbie Doyle handed me off on this program because he had to sail another super yacht. Now I've never sailed on a super yacht in my life, and this was I know, it was probably about 2015. Um, but Robbie needed someone to fill in for him, so he thought I could do it. And I'm like, all right, well I'll do it. I have no idea what I'm doing, but I'll do it. <laughs> but what's interesting about this program is that. I got down when I showed up at St. Bart's, it was from the St. Bart's bucket. Mm -hmm. Heard a lot about it, but never done it before. And I was gonna be the tactician. I'm like, all right, well, there's like 36 people on board. 
And, um, and I've never done anything like that. But one of the things I did find out, we did to go out in the practice day. I said, well, that's good. We'll go out and practice. And, um, but what I learned is see that cat, that pilot house, that's where the, the helmsman is inside that pilot house. So that's where the tactician has to be. Um, so I was a little bit unsure where I should be sitting or standing, but I had to be kind of near the helmsman so he could understand what I was saying. The helmsman in this case was the captain and the owner of the boat at that time was uh, George Sakalaris, who now has a boat called Proteus um, and now drives more. But at that time, he was fairly new to sailing and he wasn't driving. But he was sitting in a chair, kind of in the back of the pilot house, kind of looking at the whole situation. So there was a little pressure on me. <laughs> but I couldn't you know, say too much about how much I didn't have any idea what that was. <laughs> the person that was kind of in charge of the crew would just kind of lean in the window so we'd keep the window open. And he'd lean in the window and, and wait for me to say we would have to tack. And to make a, do it, decide we we're going to tack or do any maneuver, you had to plan a way in advance. So if you're going to tack, you have to say, OK, we'll stand by tack. Well, that means. A minute later, you're tacking. So you, it, you know, you had to, it was that much lead time. But I went out on the practice day. You put it on the next slide. The, um, and you know, St. Bart's was windy, but it wasn't the day we went out practice. It wasn't that windy. And obviously, it's a big, heavy boat. Yeah. And it's got lots of furniture. It's a beautiful boat down below. It's got this, you know, wood. And it's <laughs> wonderful. Boat. I'm trying to think of what rig it was on, but it was lighter air. And I was in the pilot house, and I was trying to. You know, see the, how the house was driving the boat. He got the boat going kind of nine knots, you know. It was more or less the speed he was going. And it, was, it was interesting, but at, right in front of us, there was a chart plotter. And on that chart plotter in front of me, I didn't really know what to look at. I looked at all these instruments, and there was a chart plotter. Thing. You know, it's interesting. I'm looking at your chart plotter here. Now, you have this track. And he says, oh, yeah, well, we sailed from St. Martin to St. Bart yesterday. I said, oh, that's wonderful. So um, What's this? What are these? What's this? He says, well, that's our track. That's the track we sail. Well, I kid you not. I'm not. This is, okay. <laughs> this is what the track looks at the chart plot. I sail on wet design boats, but literally, so here's St. Martin down here, mm -hmm. and here's St. Martin up here, upwind, directly upwind. So the chart, the track that they took, this was the course. <laughs> it was like this. And I'm like, so, and, and that's. What I would, that's how we were sailing. So I, I was like, hmm, that's interesting. You know, we were going pretty well. And, and I said, well, how much wind was there yesterday? He said, oh, it was kind of nice, like 15 knots. And you know, how long did it take you? And all, how are you going? He said, we're going good. We're going nine knots. We're going great. You know, really nice sail. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Now, I asked about that tack. I said, how's the tack? And I said, well, yeah, it's about, yeah, it's about what we do. I'm like, OK. It's gonna be a, it's gonna be a challenging weekend. Um, <laughs> um, so then I then I said, well, can we let me go look out the look at the sails. So I went out and looked at the sails. Go to the next photo, and I just wanted to find out if we were trimmed in all the way. And I'm looking around. I'm thinking, well, they got the mizzen trim, they got the main trim, they got the jib. And I said, maybe we move the lead a little bit and move that back. And I went back and I said, well, maybe we just let's try sheeting a little harder. Should we point harder? And I said, I tried that, this big heavy boat. So I got them, we tried this experiment. They were very tall for me. They started trimming in this boat and we got pointing higher. I'm like, well, that's good, that's good. The problem is we slowed down to six knots. <laughs> and we couldn't, and so I was like, all right, well, let's try going faster again. And we went back. So anyhow, the moral of the story is this boat um, would not do that. It would not point. That's where we are. That was what I was faced with the tactics. So anyhow. So the first day happens, we go out for the first race. I, at least I, I call Robbie that night, Robbie Doyle, and I, I asked him, I say, so Robbie, um, I said, oh, 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 let me understand, what are the tacking angles on this boat? What should I be expecting? Well, yeah, they're, you know, they're not good. They're not good. <laughs> <laughs> what did you get me into? Right, okay, at least I know what I'm dealing with. He says, well, you're not gonna have a lot of beating. I'm like, well, except tomorrow we might have to beat you all the way up the backside of the island. But anyhow, okay. Well, thank you. Anything I can do? No, you just, you know, just don't hit anybody. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> um, so what happened in that race, we did. And I, I think this is pretty pretty amazing what happened. And I, you know, I learned a lot about boats and displacement boats in this race that I hadn't learned before. So St. St. Bart's Island is kind of this, you know, island like this. And... Um, and you do this race where you kind of go down here and you, you work your way around the island. You have to beat your way up and then sail through some other islands here to then come around. And the, you know, the wind's more or less from here. And you've got to come around, then you come back and you finish. 
So what happened was, you know, we went down, we, we went down wind, went around this part, no, like that, and we kind of limped our way around up this bit um, the best we could. We did pretty well, but it was, wasn't that windy, and we positioned well, and I got some good shifts and all like that. I'm like, yeah, we're doing okay. I guess I don't hit anybody yet. Um, but what was happening is what happens is typically you go down, you've met down in the Caribbean, some of you have, and, um, and it's, look, by the time we were out there getting around the backside of the island, the squalls are starting to come through. Mm -hmm. So the squalls, and I do know, I do know that generally, you know, how you position, you want to go ahead for the squalls. And generally, if they're aiming at you or hit you, the wind bends about 20 degrees to the right, especially in the middle of the squall. And then it goes back to its original head. So what had happened is, I'm like, okay, well, we got a cloud up here. So what are we going to do? We're going to head for that cloud. And I'm just going to try to line ourselves up to the cloud. So we head for that cloud. Sure enough, we start getting ahead. And we get in here. We're getting, okay, we're going to have to pack soon. And sure enough, the squall hits us right around here. And I get headed right down here. So okay, we can tack. But it's getting windy, windy, windy. We had the full general up. I said, we have any problem with you know the squall? I'm like, no, we don't have any problem. I'm like, OK, that sounds good. So we made it. So what we did was, funny enough, the squall hit. So a big you know, big rain squall comes through, and the wind turns 20 degrees right. Sure enough, with the squall, it did that. I said, OK, let's well, stand by tack. Took you know, a minute and a half. They have to furl the jib, all this stuff. I'm like, all right, well, as long as we don't hit the island, it's good. <laughs> so we actually tacked, and we're doing pretty well. We tacked, and I looked at the truck and I'm like, no shit, we just tacked and we, you know, I must have got a good shift. And I, I just couldn't make the difference. But here's the problem. So we're coming up like this on starboard. But now we got the whole fleet kind of over here. We caught a lot of boats because we got a good shift. We got a good righty. And we're in the squall. The breeze is pretty good. But I said, okay, I looked at our tack and I said, we did pretty well in that tackle. But now I got to pick another tack. And I got a whole wall of boats going this way, like this. All, and I got, you know, there's 50 of them. And I got to pick a lane to get around this island. But if you tack these boats, if I could attack twice, it's over. We're done for the day. You know, we might as well go home. We're lucky if we can get, you can't tack. Yeah, I got to nail it. So I, a lot of these boats are over here. They're pretty high. So I'm looking for a lane. Where am I going to do? What am I going to, I don't know what I tack it. Do I tack the zigzaggy tack or do I tack? But I was looking at our parent wind angle and all like that. I said, oh my gosh, I guess that we can, um, you know, I've got to cross my fingers. I'm going to say maybe. In this, now we got more wind, maybe we'll tack in a narrower angle. But I don't know, I don't know, but I think I can. I'm looking at everybody's angle, I'm like, okay, let's stand by tack. We've got to tack before this wall of boats. Because we're, you know, we got to get around them, otherwise we're just going to be in everybody's bad air. And if I screw it up, we'll just have to tack that. So we, anyhow, we tack, and sure enough, it was windy enough. We tacked, and we were going, because it was blowing like 15 to 20, we actually tacked, and it get quite to 90 degrees, but it wasn't much worse. So we were able to kind of get around the island, didn't have to tack again. And afterwards, I was like, and we had a good race. I think we you know, finished second or something. I was like, all right, well, that's pretty good. But afterwards, what it occurred to me, you know, one of the other things that happens at St. Bart's is once you get back to the harbor, you got to then wait in line because they got to put one boat anchor at a time. They start tying them up. Mm -hmm. So there was all this, this time, this hour of waiting around, an island time as they tie up these boats. So I'm there with the owner. Talking about, I said, well, this is kind of, I showed him the track. I said, this is kind of interesting what happened here. And I showed him the track, what happened. I said, what's interesting to me is when the breeze came up, all of a sudden we, our tacking angles got a lot better. Not only a lot better, I mean a lot better. So the problem isn't in the other body. The problem is the sail plan's too small because we had our biggest general up. I said, this boat is just on the rig, so now put on the next slide. Um, oh, yeah, I, I might have gotten rid of that one. But the point was, is that we were able to, I had that one hour that we were waiting there, I think I talked him into putting a tall rig on the boat. So when I got back, I never heard, I never talked to him again about it, everything like that. We did the regatta, we had a good regatta. Next thing I know, um, I you know, hear Robbie over here, him at the loft talking that he, um, they were talking about, you know, putting a new rig on the boat and, and talking to Bill Langan about designing a bigger rig and they went and did it, they actually did it. And that picture, go back to that shot. That is, I think that's a picture with the new rig in it. They put a new carpet rig in it. But they went up I like 11 fleet feet, and they did that. And the boat sailed much better. But what I did learn from that whole thing, so they got the sail area displacement thing right, but they could go much better upwind. So what I learned from that more than anything is that the heavier you are, the more underpowered you are, you cannot point. So it's all about this whole sail thing. It's not so much about the underbody of the boat or the trim, it's about that total ratio of whether your boat is underpowered or overpowered and how to 
change gears for that. And that's really my theme tonight because I learned so much sailing that boat and I was right um, about it and I was surprised, but it did work out. And it, you know, I don't know how much it costs for a whole new rig and all the sales. But so, you know, I took another stand up. We have a boat like this in, in town. You know, here's the sailor who's priced it's a little higher. It's not 17 or 16, it's now 18 on a CNC 40. But, you know, that boat is kind of a mid 70s boat, I guess. Still, you know, going to be a little tough and light air to make it go. It's got a big lot of sail area, but it's still heavy. So that's one of the things. But a boat like that, it's harder to get it pointing. Now, I've raced against the CNC and seen them out there sailing, and they do, you know, they have a little bit of a stability issue too. But they have a pointing problem, and that the pointing problem comes from, you know, the underbody's not great, but the pointing problem comes from they're underpowered. And when they're underpowered, they don't point that well. And then, then they go to the other extreme, they get overpowered, they get this gargantuan gentle up, and they, don't, they can't do anything about it because they have to stay in a while. So any boat like this that has a, you know, a fur length head stay, that's probably the worst thing in the world that you can go to the next slide, is try to uh, control a fur length head stay because they sag like crazy. Uh, J109, one of the better boats around here for sure. And, um, you know, the sail air displacement ratio is a lot higher. This is off a sailboat, what is it called? Sailboat data, yes, it's great. Um, I think PHR uses this a lot, and um, for grading boats. But, but once again, a lot easier. Now, if a boat has a general like this, this boat, like a general, like the 105, Fred, Fred would know that. The boats for the Genoa versus the what the the jib, it's a big performance difference. So the Genoa is very effective sail at light air, but um, you pay for it in rating. But so the J109 is not a great light air boat with the little jib, but it's. Um, Really good boat with a general, really good boat. But it just gets that sailor power up, and as a result, the boat can perform so much better. And it's not just that they go through the water. I don't think it's going through the water at a different speed. It's just you end up going at a lower angle when you're underpowered. So you're sailing more distance. Okay, let's go to the next slide. And this is a MUM 30. I used to, I sailed MUM 30 Worlds for five years in a row back in the 2000s. And um, you know, look at the displacement. Sailor displacement is 29. I mean, it's a lot lighter boat. And it's very quick and very easy to power up. There's one that here, enter the sails here in Marblehead. And they sail it quite well. And um, these are these are quick little boats. And for their time, you know, they were, they were by far and away the kind of the lightest displacement boat, race boat, for a long time in that early 2000s, late 90s period. I think you know from 97 to like 2005 or so, they had a really good run from like 95. <laughs> but this boat was got powered up easy, and it would get. Planing and big breeze, um, it would be a handful of, uh, it was a regular pole boat, but it was a handful of breeze. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Um, back to the actual, the tuning, and because the, the, the reason being, um, you know, here's my team and sailing in Miami, but with a pretty good sail trip. Um, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so what we spent a lot of time looking at sails trim, but basically what I wanted to go through as before we get through is, um, you know, we measure these stripes and this is all at the quarter points. And so 25, 50% is the middle stripe and 75%. So that's from the leech and that's, those stripes are what would be parallel to the foot. So it's, would be what would be a straight line between, you know, like the foot of the boom. I um, mean, they're parallel to that at those points of the leech. And um, that camber depth, uh, stripe three just shows the lower stripe. It's only it's under ten percent. And what's interesting about this is that these numbers from whether it's Axia and Etchels, J70, Star, they don't change that much. Star gets a little flatter, but um, big boat they don't change a lot. You know, the, the extreme case might be the like big boat Africa. It, we have to get a lot flatter. We'll see those slides later. Let's go to the next slide. We can really make this sail fuller if we want to. So the last time we were, even though strike three were at eight, that's 12.65. Um, sail's got a lot of return, which is mostly with bass fin. You can change the shape of the sail correctly. And you basically, that's like pulling on the back stay more. You control bend at deck level too. Go to the next slide. And that's showing the upper stripe. The upper stripe's at 12.1. Not pretty similar, not unusual to have the top stripe and the uh, mid stripe be very similar in depth and the lower stripe be camera shape be flatter. 
go to the next slide. It's a little fuller because it's only six, seven knots of breeze in natural. So look at, we've got the top stripe. Now the stripe one is up at 15% and the mid stripes now a percent fuller. So the power up mode, it's pretty much as full as you get. You might get a little fuller, but how we do that, we straighten up the mast, um, ease the back stay more, um, which sags the head stay, gives more power on the jib. Go to the next slide. This showing the lower two stripes, so that's 12 and a half, and then 9% at the lower stripe. Not too crazy a number, but that's kind of a powered up setup, as you can see, it looks pretty powerful. Mm -hmm. Okay, next slide. Um, okay, go to the next one, it might be redundant. That's slightly different. A little more breeze, so this is 15, 18 through wind speed, and um, I'm looking at strike one, now we're down to 10%, and oh, that's uh, strike two, the mid stripe's at 10, and the lower stripe's at like 7.9. Basically flatten the sail with mast bend. More back stay, chalking the mast straighter so we can put more back stay, so that's an over bend, and we keep the head stay tighter. Okay, go again. Um, this is even, this is a lot of wind. We took these photos in a squall, and it was blowing, you know, 25, maybe 30, um, having a hard time, you know, controlling the boat in that condition. But the main could get pretty flat, but it just shows how much mash pen there was on there. Okay, next slide. So the actual is pretty nice because we can sail in 25 or 30 knots. You just keep pulling the back stay hard. Don't trim the main in too tight. You get the camber stripes as flat as you can with mash pen. This is the gym in that same condition. <clears throat> Doing the best we can to support the headstay sagging. You can see the headstay is still sagging. This is a heavy gym. This is like double stitch seams, six point, you know, eight ounce gym. Um, it's all you can do just to sail the boat in this condition. Next slide. Measure the Campbell stripes there. Even had a hard time flattening out that gym. And that, you know, it's pretty full even at stripe two because we're still having trouble controlling the headstay sag. That's 17% camber at the middle stripe. Although, actually, like full jibs because it's a happy boat. Okay, go to the next one. And that's the upper stripe. It's 15%, middle stripe 17%. One thing you'll notice is the biggest variable while sailing, certainly almost anyone in that boat, is if you took a thousand photos of your jib and not change anything, everyone would measure different because the headset is always moving. So that's a huge variable on all our boats. So every time, in every wave, every little thing that head stays just moving a little bit, which is changing the shape of the sail. So it's something to be very mindful of. 20 to 25 knots. Um, there's the camber, that's the lower stripe. So that's middle stripe, 18%, lower stripe, 14%. Pretty powerful jib, and that's that jib's like steel. You know, it's hard jib. Keep going, next slide. Is that the, yeah? Once again, put flat down, how much wind? 18 knots, flat down out of main, lots of back stay. That's a middle stripe under 10%, lower stripe 8%. Gotta get sailed pretty flat, flat is low drag. So anytime the boat is, you're trying to depower the boat, there's no point in being overpowered. Six, seven knots, still not crazy, but the, we get the camber up. So you can see that we have to change as the wind speed changes got to change the core depth of the sail quite a bit. So it's just taking one main sail, it's got to work through the entire range. It's not like you can put up multiple mains, you get one main. In all these classes that we sail in, you get, just like you're, you guys, you know one has more than one main. Every, all these classes are just one main boats now. Other than the star, and they just generally put one main. Okay, next slide. How much is this? Five, six hours, very light air, you see very powered up. It looks very twisty, but from off the boat, it isn't so twisty, but that's kind of the look. Um, always, if I ever take you photos, if you want to take photos of your own boat, you always try to get the boom in the photo, because that's the reference for um, twist. Um, you go to the next slide, There's more slides of showing the same thing. You see we spend a lot of time studying it, what's working, what's not working. Um, mid stripe, you notice the middle and upper stripe very close in camber, very typical scenario. And, Pretty successful formula. Um, once again, this one, even though I like this look when the top stripe is even a little fuller than the mid stripe. So that might, we actually broke a mass at one point. We had a hard time getting a mass that was good enough, as good as the first one. That's a, um, I think that's a, yeah. looks to me, it looks like a J7 jib that we have. Go to the next slide. 
Yeah, okay, so that is definitely a J70 J. This is a J70 J11, you can tell by the sweat back spreaders. Go back to the other one, just want to look at it. Yeah, it's a sweat back spreader. So that's a J70 jib. Right, that would be a J10. You see the jib's a flatter sail than an actual boat. Lighter, just like we talked about the whole displacement thing. Even though it doesn't have a huge sail plane, it's got a big jib. The jib on a J70 is the exact same size as a natural jib. Actually, it's a little bigger on the foot. So, but we have to, what works on J70 is a flatter jib than works on actual because the boat's half the weight. Same thing. Okay, there's some uh, core depth. Things. This is obviously trying to power it up in very light air. This is about as full as we can get. And this is a Florida State. So this is a natural ship. You can see, that's why I put it up there for a comparison. The mid stripe at 18. So you can see how much, that's why I put that slide up there. The difference in camber depth between a boat that weighs 3,400 pounds versus a boat that weighs 1,700 pounds. Um, so Etchell's versus. So we just need a more powerful sail on the Etchell's to make it go. We have to work to make a flat breeze, but if we don't have that full of sail and light air, the, the dog don't hunt. Okay? Um, strike one, 17, 16, that's, you know, wouldn't want to be any flatter than that. And then Etchell's jib. If I put it, I originally, I actually tried when I got my G70 put it, Etchell's jib on it. It was pretty good in light air, wasn't mm -hmm. that? Um, Etchell's jib, uh, medium jib, and go to the next photo. That's that same jib kind of powered up but measured. So it goes, shows the core depth. The nice thing about I like about this jib, um, <coughs> top stripe a little fuller than the middle stripe. A lot going on at the top of the jib, lots of power. See how much headstay sag there is? And when we have a lot of headstay sag, we stall up the luff like you could in the townie. Um, to put the power back in, you're kind of putting, pounding a lot of cloth in there. So it's a same jib. Same type of medium jib in light air, trying to get it powered up. Lots of head sea sack, powering the sail up. The boat likes it, getting those camp core depths up to 18% or more. That's a uh, Etchell's obviously, going up wind. And um, you see, even though we've got the jib kind of powered up, it's not that much wind there. The top of the jib's fuller, but we're sheeting in to eight mm -hmm. degrees uh, now with the track system. So that jib, probably at eight and a half degrees right there. but. You say, well, the bottom of the jib's really flat, but the, above that, it can get pretty windy. You see that lower camber stripe, right? So I put that photo in there, it's pretty flat. That's good for pointing, so we, sheet, we sail up to sheet the sail pretty hard. Let's go to the next one. This is um, an natural jib for sure. You see how powered up it is. Once again, those magic numbers kind of over 18% of the top stripe, middle stripe, almost 18. Okay. This is a little more uprangey jib, and um, even fuller. And this is lighter air, 3P2 jib, pretty powered up. And this is, that's kind of the end of the actual photos. It just shows how far forward the rig goes downwind. Um, that's a world champion boat. Um, they basically invert the rig downwind, which is, a, is fast because Main so full, much like you've probably seen a star go downwind or a townie, it's got the weak way forward. And you know, the townie, you say to do it for balance of the rally, it's just way better downwind because you get flow off the boat, off the mask. I'll go back to that other picture of the J70. I put that photo in there in the J70s because of all the dirty air. We talk about, you see where 819 is and boat 3 is? Mm -hmm. Well, they're actually not doing bad in the race. They're doing pretty well in the race. And somehow they got to get through it. The problem is when you're, the good news is when you're on port tack, on that scenario, yeah, you're a little bit of chopped up air, but you're actually kind of in the port tack lift because all the boats are bending the wind on front of you on starboard. Of course, you gotta look for a place to attack and get through there, but you gotta be ripping there. And my point of this, putting this slide is, is when you get in this condition and you're in chopped up air like this, you've got to sail looser, fuller, more powered up, kind of eased out in the sheets and be, and the helmsman gotta be ripping along because the air's all chopped up. And because those boats are bending the breeze, you can, Whenever you're, I'm behind, wherever I'm in, I never sail the same tack as the boats in front of me, because you're basically just sailing in the crappy air. Um, so I always try to be in the opposite tack, out behind them, and that's, you're in the lift, because they're bending the breeze in front of you, especially if there's a lot of boats. If you have a crappy start, you get up through the slingshot. Um, that's uh, J70, pretty powered up, that's in Marina Del Rey. Uh, J70 goes from you know being quite underpowered in light air to quite overpowered quite easily. Not quite a lot of stability. Go to the next one. J70 
J70 jib, it's a fairly new jib, a lot of head seats had to power it up. You know, these jibs aren't very full, so we rely on head seats had to make them fuller when it's light air. Because we only have one jib through the whole condition. It's just a picture looking at the lower stripe. You can see they're sheeted at 10 degrees. Uh, picture J70 going up wind, sheeted pretty hard. Um, you know, that's where the back stay aligned. You can see that even in that amount of breeze, the boom's not, it's pretty much on center line. The lower stripe's not very far off center. The sail can be sheeted really hard because the jib's so big. Camber depth's on that, different looking at an actual, is it? So when you go from one boat to another, it's not that different. This is the sail pretty powered up, same sail, exact same sail, just powered up more for light air, so not to breeze, max power. Straighten up the mast, ease the back stay, ease the outhaul a little bit. Um, ease the rig tension off. It's another thing you do on the J70 to ease the head stay tension. Okay, go to the next slide. Just another picture, J70 depowered. We huge amount of range of adjustments. We go through, I'm trying to remember the difference of the settings of the rig, it's a lot. The lowers, you don't, you do a half as much as the uppers um, on tension. But we have to, we change the rig tension for every, you can't change it during the race. You change it for every race, basically. J70s, big swept back spreaders, they have a lot of, uh, you know, these boats with swept back spreaders have a lot of control over the head stay. You got to, but if you don't adjust the rig and the lower shroud start going too slack, or the lowers, you know, a lot of rig is hanging on those lowers. So you control mass bed a lot with the lowers because they're so swept back. So that's a J70 main, look pretty powered up there. Powered up as it can get. That's a Joel Rowan's boat, Catapult, one of, one of past world champions. Um, J70, don't know, just a picture of mass bed. Not a lot, you know, we don't start to sail around with as much men as nearly a uh, naturals. You know, so it has less control of our mass bed. We have a little more control over mass bed. Savasana, Brian Keane's boat, really he's won a lot of regards. Won the NAs last year. That's his main, maybe sailing marblet for all I know. Uh, St. Pete. Um, so he's pretty powered up here. You see Camber, you know, it's not that different. Look at it, you know, 12%, pretty similar to actually a little flatter, but not a lot flatter. Um, another boat. Um, and Strike three, they're still kind of 10 and a half percent. So we'll fly it up, really like the way they're set up, but by the way, I took the phone. Um, J70 jib, you see it gets flat, flat on the natural shear because the boat gets powered up. And because the displacement's lighter, you cannot sail a J70 with the powered up a jib, and you're just gonna be tipping over. Go back to that previous slide. J70, all these boats like this that don't have a lot of stability, you cannot heal them much. I mean, that's max heel on a boat like that, maybe, 17 degrees, that boat right now is sailing around probably at 12 degrees to heel. Not a bad thing to monitor is heel angle. Mm -hmm. um, and um, not, you know, usually like to sail with, you want to have less than 10 degrees to heel but in light air, but you don't want to have more than 17 degrees to heel on boats like this. Actually, you can run a heavy keel, big heavy keel boat, you load it up, you can have more rig tension. It's a J7, it's a world boat I sailed on the worlds, uh, three ball with Hardesty, and um, that's a jib we sailed. We sheeted really, really hard. It was really good because we were a big crew. Um, we were fast getting, we could make it. You see the leech telltale up there? The little red telltale up near the spreader. It was flowing, and we made this work really well. Some Mexican teams as well. Okay, next slide. Uh, same. Same team, one of the Mexican teams. They got the Mexican NAs come up. I mean, the, Me the NAs come up in Mexico um, in the middle of May. Okay, now I know a little bit more boats like everybody else sails. Um, it's a J111. I sail J111 a lot in the worlds and whatnot. This is just the boat with the sails on the model um, and then the sails um, after the model. The model and the sails, just so they fit the boat, they fit the rig well. I did a bunch of pictures of mains. I'm not even sure what this is, but you know, go back to the other slide. See the camber depths? You're pretty flat on this boat, but I mean, they're not too different than the actual J70. It doesn't change very much from one boat to another. Go to the next one. Looks like a Beneteau. I think it's a 367 main. Um, you know, not very different, very similar camber depths to what we've been sailing. The actual J70 doesn't really change that much. 
that what works. G111 mean, very similar deal. Doesn't look that different from a G70 mean, does it? I don't think it is that different. Um, this is a, uh, we didn't make this out, I'm glad I didn't make it, but it's a K31 mean. I don't even know what, who, what brand it is, and I, I don't know, really, I don't recognize it, but uh, we just found it in the files, but, um, but measure, look at the core depths. Nothing, you know, nothing unusual. 11% of the mid strike, nothing too unusual. Okay, excellent. It's a K31 uh, jib. Got it sheeted pretty hard, but it's a pretty full jib. Look at the core depths. That's the mid strike 15. Not too different from a J70 in terms of, so it's not much different from these sales from one to another. Strike two, that's a mid strike. Strike three, 14. 14%, nothing unusual. There's a boat Fred could remember. Um, that's a uh, G105. Go to the next slide. That's Fred's main. I think you were 444, weren't you? No? 304. Yeah. And then, um, so once again, not very different. One thing about, I, you know, I didn't sail on the 105 much, but I never got used to, you know, the sheet of more outboard. And, and I think it was a little bit, they didn't do much in all, it didn't seem to work well. I think it's a little bit of the one I was talking about that that power displacement thing was, was tough. You know, for the weight of the boat, they sailed well, but it did best in a breeze. And light air, just couldn't put the bow up that much, as long as everybody's the same. You're, uh, it's a birds of a feather. This is a picture of Stag. You've probably seen Stag racing around here. Um, Will Hendel took these pictures in. That's like a pretty old main that they still have and try to make it work. But Stag's mass bend. Um, so, but that's, you know, they got a pretty nice rig on the boat. Okay, you can, it's a, on the other tack. Yeah. Rig's pretty nice, straight out spreaders. It's a boat called Blackfish. That's, I took this picture or put it in there because it shows that's a furling system. I don't, and very hard to keep the furling system under control on head stays that. Um, that you know, even with sweat back spreaders, the rig tension on wasn't even that windy. That's what you're looking at. It's, and in more breeze, it's more than that. That's that gentle one there. It's probably the heavy, or the, you know, too, doesn't want to be too full. But I'm guessing that's the two, the mainsail. You know, once again, on the flatter side, but the thing with this boat, it's not a huge range of mass bend. Even though it's a carbon mass that may look like wood, it's carbon. Um, but because there isn't a huge range of mass bend, you can't start with a main that's too full or you're never going to be able to flatten it out. So this is of our boat, the Trip 41, and um, kind of saved the best for last. <laughs> so uh, go back to that photo again. because it's, you know, I always find it's really hard to look at photos with the stripes on because uh, with all the, you know, the measurements on there. So um, you, you obviously the main's pretty flat there. I mean, we've got to sail pretty flat. Marcel will tell you. We'll, and Andy, um, you get pretty flat pretty fast. But on that boat, we're sailing with cameras, so not crazy. Strike one is the top strike. These stripes are on the same spot as all the other sails. And strike two is the mid stripe. So that's a little under 10%. It's not crazy. It's flat on the etchels, but it's not crazy <laughs> flat. You know, the J70 gets looks like this. So these boats, it doesn't change that much. We just start out. Oh, go back to that photo again. So strike three, which is the lower strike, um, above that lower batten, it's a little under 8%. And to adjust the mass, we have a lot of range of mass bend on this boat, so we're able to uh, crank on the upper backstay, which bends the mast uh, quite a bit, a lot. And that's how we adjust it, and we want to go more powered up. We, Of course, you got those bricks you can put on and all like that before the race, we don't do it during the race. So this main starts out like pretty flat. It doesn't take long to get overpowered in this boat. So we've got to be able to flatten out pretty quickly. Big difference in whether we have enough rig tension. So we put bricks in. So we're always arguing about what, we're, what bricks we're going to put in for the race. So the more you tension up the rig, the total, that you can do spacers under the to tension up the mass. The more you do that, the more structure you give this truss system. And as a result, you support the head stay better. So then you can pull the back stay harder, which helps keep the head stay tighter but without overbending the mass. The problem is if you don't do that, the mass, you pull the back stay, the mass just bends, the head stay's still saggy. That's the case with all boats, certainly all displacement boats. 
It's always the same thing. So everybody's like, why do you have all this tuning and all these guides and all these changing the tension and putting bricks in underneath the mass stuff that I draw? It's because we're trying to control the head steady and the mass bend. So as you bend the mass to flatten the main, that the head state, the mass doesn't over bend before the head state gets tight. This is the two uh, medium they call it in this case. Uh, that's unmeasured. I mean, that's, you know, so go to the next photo. Probably just don't know how much further there is here. Oh, go back to that one. You can see there, we've got more back stay on the main splatter. That's probably only 10 much for maybe 12. Um, this is the, the marks, and that's what, there's our cells trimming. He's got marks on, especially in that lower spreader to come into. We probably sheet is around eight degrees. A little outside the marks there. Once again, none of these seals are super full. Sheeted into the in halls into the doghouse. Um, I don't know why all the instrument covers were up. Um, you try to, I have no idea. Um, yeah, they got it sheeted pretty hard there. And there's the measurements. So the strike two, that's 15% of the mid stripe. That's not that different from the J70 chip. It's a little flatter. It's not crazy. Um, so it's not like there's a big difference from one mode to another. Lower stripe, a little under 12%. So yeah, the chip's a little flatter. It's not a lot flatter. Not a lot different than the J70 chip, is it? Than, than we looked at earlier. This is the three. This is actually the North three that came in the boat. Um, we're out there sailing with it early on, and it was a three guy seal. It was pretty bulletproof, but go to the next slide. Um, Obviously, we didn't trim the main as hard right there. It has a big bubble in it, but it just shows the bass bed. You can see the three missed the spreaders by a lot. That's why I was looking at that sail to see how it fit the rig, which didn't fit the rig very well at all. Obviously, you try to get these sails, even if you're, it is an upright sail, to fit the rig better to get close to the spreaders. Um, just shows the rig plan of how we do sails and design sails on the rig so we get the geometry right. As you can see, the molds don't change that much. J111, it's the only a hot angle puff. Wouldn't be surprised if it's like Chicago Mac or something. I don't know, hard to say. Um, probably a J105, yeah, with the tacky stuff, with the, with the class spinnaker, which is kind of small. Um, that's the last slide. Yeah. yeah, that's good. Any questions on anything? I kind of flipped through a lot of things. I think sail, trim, and design, and all that is, is uh, Changes for every boat, but the bottom line is the, the shapes are very similar, mm. as you can see. It only we only go up or down a few percent from a really slow boat to a, a boat like it's an overpowered. I don't think anything's more overpowered than that trip 41 I sail. Um, so that, but it doesn't. Nothing changes that much other than we have to power up or depower more. But in general, that's the that's the how it works. You can see there's not that much difference between the boats. So. Good. Yep. How do you determine the marks on the spreaders for your jib? It's a really good question. And I don't know what you mean like for any of these boats and all like that. Um, basically, the best way to do it is from the model when you put it on the model. Mm -hmm. But I think it's that's where I've been doing it mostly. But from the etchels, working backwards over the years, we didn't have that. so. We just put more marks on until we begin to narrow it down. We started from the outboard end of the spreader. J70 chip cheats pretty much the middle of the spreader. Went a little inside that now, so we have a couple of marks inside that. But most of those marks are pretty close to the middle of the spreader. Um, like if it's a Genoa, you know, the Genoa, like a jib lead on a Genoa, is always aligned with, let's say, the shroud base, the chain plate base. You know, that pretty much where the jib lead is, mm -hmm. stuff like that. So on a non-overlapping jib, it's gonna be close to the middle of the spreader, but as it gets lighter or heavier, you'll have marks outside that, but that's, there's no real unbelievable science to it other than it, I think on most of boats like ours, it's mostly the middle or inside the middle. But most of those marks mm -hmm. probably come from, a, from the model. I have a question for maybe the group is interested in. Uh, obviously, I have the privilege to, to trim pretty new sails for the most part. <laughs> what would you suggest when the sail is two years old, three years old? How, what's the best way to maintain the <laughs> trim? Three years old, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, 
Mm. Well, depending on if it's a main sole or a head sole, I mean, the, the main, you can see that the core depths don't change that much from one design to another. So, you know, if you have a boat that the mass doesn't bend on, there's not much you can do other than maybe reef, which is really hard because you've got to shake the reef to go down wind or reach. You need all that sail here to help. An old sail is pretty good at a distance race, an old mainsail because it's full. You don't have to go up wind with it. So it's not like an old main slow in a distance race. So that, you know, very common for people to go in like Chicago Mac or something like that to put up their old sails because they're faster, because they're fuller mm. at, in a distance race. Because you don't spend that much time going straight up wind. So that's a very common thing and actually is a good thing. And one thing I never like doing is putting on a brand new sail in really light air. Like for the Etchells being winners, I went back to my old name that the girls used on Fast Mermaid all summer because the new main was not broken in. So in many respects, new isn't always better, although in a head sole, it helps. But in an older main, as long as it's not too full. So what happens to a main, it gradually gets fuller and maybe past the sweet spot, but then it's probably pretty good for distance racing. Mm. And then in um, light air is when you probably, is the worst. Because as a main gets older, it gets fuller. And the worst time it gets fuller is like in really light air that we sail in all the time. You say, oh, that would be good, but like, no, not for going up wind, it's just too draggy, the wind can't get around the shape. So if you can't bend the mass more, because that's the way to do it, that's how you flatten out a, a sail that's older, is you bend the mass more, and or you carry the head stay tighter, or you use more howdy on the, on the jib, or you carry the lead back further, or you bring the sail off to maybe try to recut it. The jib, the jib you won't want to sail around with as much sag, but the jib's tougher. I, a newer jib makes a bigger difference than a newer main. That's for sure. I don't know if that answers anybody's question, but I, I feel like you can't get away with an older jib for, for very long, except for maybe in a distance race, if you're not going up wind. But you can get away with an older main. In fact, some of the older mains are fine. Like that main, a picture, now those were the mains. We, we, the only reason we put on a new main on the trip, it wasn't because the other main was wearing out or anything, is that we, wanted a smaller roach because we were overpowered. So Bump and I argued about it for a year and a half. And then <laughs> I just went and built it. And then we put it on, he's like, oh, okay, it's, it is oh, it is better. <laughs> so I'm like, we can't sail around overpowered all the time. This is ridiculous. So uh, that's the argument. And these guys, Andy and Marcel heard those arguments all the time. It's constant. Mm -hmm. that, um, but yeah, they just being overpowered, it just, it's not, being underpowered or overpowered is, is terrible. You know, being underpowered in light air, you just heard saw, you heard my story about what it, why it doesn't work. You can't point. So you're sailing more distance around the course. It's simple as that. At some point. And by the way, it, one of the things, the reasons I put up that light, that other slide was downwind, just in case, in case anybody doesn't know, what is the optimum downwind angle? And it, whether it's a J105 and Etchell's, any of these boats, it's always in light air and under 10 knots, it's always a reciprocal of the upwind angle. There's never a boat I'm ever on that I'm not doing that in under 10 knots. We're always reciprocating the upwind angle on the angle downwind. If everybody says, what's that perfect angle? The perfect angle is always within one degree, a half a degree, is always a reciprocal of the optimum upwind angle, Ooh. every boat. Ooh. So everybody's like, I'm like, you know, why do people do anything different than that? So I've seen to look at shifts upwind and I'm going downwind, I look at how the angles are of the boats going upwind. That's how I decide who's in a lift or a header going upwind, you know, with the rest of the fleet. Are they in a lift or a header? Because I look at their angles, because they're exactly the same, just turn the boat around and see what they'd be going down in, or that they should be going down. People tend to sail their boats very good angles upwind, but they don't tend to sail their boats great angles downwind. You know, they do it in the better classes that, you know, they get used to sailing the right angle. The guys with A sails like uh, J105, they know the angles to sail, and if they don't sail them right, they're gonna get uh, spit out the back. But that's what the angle is. It, it, it's every boat I've ever been on, it's the exact same thing. And then I go out and I see the eye of the east sail and dip down wind and it's not, it's not, not working. Um, you know, when the breeze comes up to a certain amount, then they can get away with you know, getting lower angle. The etchers finally do once you get above you know, 15, you can sail lower angles. But that certainly is a, a, a really key thing, which I'm amazed people don't do more often, you know, down wind, get the angles right. You know, what, you know what? You know what angle should I sail? Just follow that guy that's coming at us on the bow. That's pretty much that's the angle. Um, that wouldn't work. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, that nub you have for a sail area, displacement. Yep. What nub would be? A, a well, it's a, you know the boats have gotten. It's a great question. 
you know, the older boats definitely were heavier. But you know, a very typical, boat, let's say about like a, um, a Frere 36 or something like that. It was right around, you know, that's a good boat. Um, that was right around 20, 18, 19, 20, sailor displacement, which wasn't bad. I mean, it's very typical boats of that era. Um, and then pretty, that's a pretty comfortable place to be. And then you got, saw that um, Nelm 30, which is a little bit of a handful when the breeze comes up, and that's almost up near near 30. That's a, lot, you know, that's a handful of sailor. I, I don't even know what it is on my trip. I can't imagine. That's ridiculous, like 40 or something. That boat's silly. Um, but, you know, boat like, like Chris is here, moved back, you know, the 41. I had, a, I, had a, I had a CNC 41 for several years, and that is probably right around that. That has a lot of sail area. It's probably right around that 19, 20 range. Yeah, a lot of boats are in that range. I just think it's pretty tough to sail a boat that's under 16, you know, 17, like that boat, Axie and stuff. They, that's why I don't sail them around here because it's too light. That's why I have to go where the place is trade winds and whatnot. You can't sail them. They tried to do a super, boat, super yacht regatta at Newport once. It was just too light. You could hardly get these things to go. They never finished the day. They just have to you know, start up the engine and go. I don't even know what's going on. But yeah, they don't go in light. I mean, they've gotten faster and faster. Like even older, newer super yachts have gotten faster and faster and faster. But but yeah, those old boats like that boat actually it was beautiful. They didn't want to sell it, and it probably helped them when they spent whatever they spent to put a new rig on it. But and they still have it. But it's uh, it's still got displacement, sailor displacement issues, even that. But it did get better. Um, but I'll never forget that for the rest of my life. How that, having sailed that race and sailed on that boat, and how impactful it was to learn how much sailor displacement impacts pointing. It's, it's huge. And then, it, and then it started to make all sense to me, because I guess on the start, mm -hmm. that thing points like crazy. It's always overpowered for the most part. So. Any other questions? I don't want to keep people too long. Yeah? Can you explain how the mass bend flattens the sail? Uh, <clears throat> well, OK, so if it, let's say the mass is um, <coughs> straight, and we design a sail which for a straight, for no mass bend. So anything we bend the mast from straight um, would be will flatten that sail out. So if we, if how are we? Yep, it'll bend it. So if from straight, it'll it doesn't matter if it starts straight and we bend the mast. Usually it doesn't be that way, but we straight the mast. So basically what it does is every time we design any mainsail from from here on in for any amount of mast bend, you take the total amount of mast bend, whether it's a star which bends you know almost a foot. Or you know a twelve meter, whatever that bends a lot, you know, just and um, and you divide that by about sixty six percent, and that's how much total up curve that you put in. So you're using that last third, thirty percent of, of of mass bend to flatten the main. And so what happens when in light air when you sail the mass straighter, like you know, what they call pre bend, is um, the boat. Let's say the mass, the sail. Design in max power condition, when do you want the sail to be the fullest in max power condition, which is like 10 knots? You know, 8 to 10, depending on the boat. In star boat, that's like 7 to 8. But on my boat, like the Trip 41, it's like 6 to 8, this max power. And then you're depowering after that. But on most boats, it's you know about 10 knots, 11 knots, you're sailing max power, and after that, you're trying to depower. But um, in, you have to find ways to, really, there's not many options on a main without bending the mass. I know, I mean, you pull the cutting out, you can tighten out all. You can ease the sheet, that depowers the main. Um, there's not many ways to do it other than you read. So having a boat that doesn't mass them bend is a problem. What's happening with the sail shape when the mast bends? Well, you're just taking cloth out of the front. Just the you know, same thing as if the head stays tighter. You know, let's say head stays sagging. Um, you're adding more shape to the sail, um, to the jib, you're adding more depth, oh, a lot. It happens quickly. I mean, you know, we fiddle around with quarter inch, you know, millimeters of love curve and stuff like that. It's almost laughable compared to, you know, the tuning, you know, can, um, what you can do with tuning. So, um, but what happened, you're just taking cloth, just pure geometry. You're just grabbing cloth out and pulling it between, you know, two points and taking shape out that way. You know, like a laser, you know, bending a mass of laser, you get it flat. One of, you know, that's a, per, a real or fin main, but a laser is a perfect example of how mass bend works by bending the mass, how flat a main can get, and, and vice versa, how full it can get. You know, like a laser main's probably designed, you know, the mass bends a lot. That's designed with, even though the cost's a little stretchier and they got a radial main now, but 
That mask bends, you know, seven, eight inches max. So they probably have two thirds of that in love curve. And so maybe that sail has, you know, four or five inches of love curve in it. And they use the last third, 30% of the mask bend to flatten the main. And everything else is to power it up in light air or help it get that wind. So you can't have too flat a sail. That's the problem, you can't have too flat a sail to go down wind above that doesn't have a spinnaker. Like a town, you don't have a spinnaker. That's why you gotta be careful not to have too flat a sail. You gotta go down wind too. Flat sails down wind are slow, but you can't have such a full sail you go up with. You're not gonna go up with in light air. The town is tricky. And that rig forward thing, I don't think the rig forward is as big a deal upwind as it is downwind in town. Because the star boat, you put the rig through a huge range. Um, you come from, the mast goes from way back to the, the tip of the mast over the bow in light air because you get flow. Otherwise, the wind trap. If we bring our mast, if you bring the mast back in a star boat before you get to Lord Mark, that's why you, it was, it was always a yard sail going around the Lord Mark because you've got to carry the rig forward all the way to Lord Mark and then it just all comes back and, and you sheet in the sail and it looks like it's a complete yard sail at the Lord Mark, but it works because otherwise the wind traps. So as soon as that mast comes back, the wind comes in and it, get, it, tries, it, does, it gets trapped. Whereas if the rig's forward, the wind comes in and it flows. It comes and flows off the leash like it would a laser. That's why it works well in townie. You don't want to be too. You know. That's why townies go so well downwind. They're quick downwind. Um, they're very fast downwind. Right? They reach well. They, they get a big main and they, they go well. But the main can only be just so full because you got to be able to deal with it. You townies get overpowered by wind and the breeze pretty quickly. So but that's why that's the method of the madness of the townie. I mean, people talk about the balance upwind. I, I really think it's okay upwind. Doesn't really wouldn't really matter. But downwind makes a big difference. So be able to, that's why in a town you don't want to have the shrouds too tight. Just anything that lets the mask go for the forward downwind has got to be faster. Just got to be. Um, so, there's no doubt about that. Any other questions on this? I'll stick around for a while. All right. One more. One more question. If not, <laughs> we'd like to thank Judd and Lee. <laughs> See you back next year or on the club, on the deck, and boating season is coming, so time to get the shrink wrap off. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs>